very important for you to kind of consider, um, especially within that informal level of activity within the outdoors. And um, you know, there's 18,000 people on Snowdon alone on a busy day. You know, a single day, 18,000 people go over the measured turnstiles and are on the mountain. They're not all on the summit, but that's a lot of people out there doing something active. And a very, very tiny proportion of those people count. You know, they're, they're not being led, they're not doing this commercially with, a, with an instructor, they're not in a club, they're just people that can just park their car and go into the great outdoors. So what we're going to think about is the kind of the provision side of the sector. When those people do go to an activity provider, what is it they go there for? <coughs> okay? So, so hold that thought. But before that, we're going to talk about the whole of the kind of the provision side of things, the, the landscape, the, the scale, and the opportunity. And I've got one very simple question for you. How many of you folks, when you were in your teenage years at school, went on a residential outdoor visit or, or an outdoor experience? Put your hands up. See how many. Yeah, almost all of you, which is which is great. What's really interesting, and um, I'm um, make a generalisation here. You know, I will. Rather draw it out of you, let me describe it and make a few sort of suppositions. I would imagine that, given the age group of us as a group, I would imagine that it probably happened at about 13, 14 years of age, something like that. And you probably went away for a residential week, and you probably worked up towards it within the kind of the, the school syllabus and within the curriculum. You knew it was coming, you built up and did some sort of field work and field study type work in advance of it. But then when you went, you actually had this fantastic developmental experience where you tried all sorts of activities that, that you'd never tried before. You probably went to a national park to do it, so you probably jumped into a coach and drove for a few hours to a beautiful wilderness place, to a funny little outdoor centre, which was probably a local out authority outdoor <coughs> centre. You probably had very qualified instructors and and you know, very sort of um, experienced teachers sort of facilitating that development. And you probably tried some new things. Little Billy fell in love with kayaking, and little Billy never got picked for the first team in football, but hey, he's really good in a boat. And that was one of the things that you discovered about him and he discovered about himself. But it was probably a very developmental experience. Does that sound about right? Yeah? Now, the good news is that that still occurs, that kind of model. When you ask people about the outdoor industry, they all hark back to thinking about being on a residential package on a course with an instructor in a group. And I think it's really important for us as we move <coughs> into this next phase of this, this workshop to think more broadly about providers and activity providers and, and, and who they are and what they provide. So when Kelly goes for that run in Delamere Forest, and she is, is fitness in nature, she's not going for a run out of her front door. She's bothering to drive to Delamere Forest. So the Forestry Commission are the activity provider. There's no group, no instructor, no course, no residential experience. But she's gone to that provider for specific reasons. And it might be that it's the parking and the floodlit trail and the toilets and the changing facilities, or, or that the guys there with their mountain bikes are there because of the bike wash facility and the cafe. Yeah? So we need to open our minds and think beyond the kind of classic model of the instructed residential out outdoor activity course. Does that make sense? Happy with that? Excellent. Now the good news is that, that in terms of provision, that old fashioned stuff is still going on. You know, it's still as healthy as ever, it's different, it's under threat, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's also been sort of augmented by the, the modern phenomena of the micro-adventure. And we, we've moved into a world where people, you know, the, the experience economy, people want to buy an experience now. And rather than buying it by the week in a kind of big, lumbering, sort of residential way, in, in, you know, over the hills and far away in a national park, they want to buy it by the hour, by the, by the half hour, by the half day. And so that traditional model of the outdoors has been augmented by this sort of experience. So this is Exeter City Centre, Exeter Quay. How many folks have been to Exeter, Exeter Quay? Okay, not so many, it's a fascinating place. You know, if you, if you kind of go down there, you're in the heart of, a, of, a, of a, an English city, and what we've got going on here is a very innovative climbing competition. You can't, you can't see it as such, but on the other side of that panel, it's a, it's a steep overhanging climbing wall above the water in the quay. It's a deep water soloing competition. The great and the good of the international climbing world are gonna get on that, you know, s step off a little platform and then have a climbing competition to see if they can climb to the top. And if they don't, they're going to dob off into the water and it's all hilarious and they're going to make fools of themselves. Very nicely packaged, very entertaining. It might be very elite, but it's very accessible for an enormous group of people. You know, it looks like a lot of fun. Um, and so what you've got, of course, because it's a, a city centre, is a huge community footfall. And you go to Exeter Key of an evening, 
There's people coming out of the woodwork, left, right, and centre. Families going on pedalos to, to go and see the wildlife, you know, classic explorers. You've got people coming out to do a park run together and kind of meeting after work. You've got people just going for a walk or a, or a pint in the, in the fresh air. So, you know, it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of people there and they're there for a lot of different reasons. That's then being serviced by a lot of very good kind of, you know, small, medium-sized enterprises, so small businesses. And the thing that's great about it here is they're working together in a really healthy kind of symbiotic way. So you've got this wonderful water sports shop around the corner where you could buy your first sit-on-top kayak and you could buy a lesson on how to use it, you know, on this lovely sheltered bit of, of flat water, okay? You could also walk into that shop and buy yourself, a, you know, a hardcore expedition kayak and a trip to Peru to go and paddle some gnarly white water if that's what you wanted. So they service the entire kind of sporting pathway from your first step to relatively kind of elite sort of high level participation. The same is true about the climbing wall around the corner, Exeter Key, um, the Key Climbing Centre, very modern, very state of the art, you know it's about as good as it gets. Lots of local partnerships with local schools, local universities, there's a, a, an outdoor centre just down the the, the key a little bit and they kind of work with them very closely rather than that outdoor centre having its own climbing wall these days they'll use the local commercial climbing wall in partnership and, uh, and, and use these local activities. The surf shop's exactly the same. You could buy your, your first, first ever longboard, foam board, you could go in there and get a spare fin for your six foot thruster, you know, and everything in between. Okay? What we've also seen is some very good, very savvy sort of bike and, and, and hire companies. There's a lovely little firm here called Saddles and Paddles. And, um, and they've realised that people aren't canoeists or aren't bikers necessarily, aren't cyclists. They, they've understood that actually what their market is, is family explorers who are coming, or family adventurers even, who are just coming down for a bit of activity together, who stumble upon them and go, you know what, it would be ace to jump in an open boat, paddle it down the canal, you know, it feels really, you know, sort of confidence inspiring, it's shallow, it's like we're only ever 15 feet away from the bank, so we don't have to know anything about canoeing. We can hire a boat, paddle for a couple of miles down to the Double Locks pub, go and have a pint and some lunch, you know, sort of family lunch, hand in the, uh, the canoes, and then hire a bike for the afternoon and ride back together up the towpath. But it's the activity, you know, it's the, it's the vehicle for all this stuff that's important. Um, not the specific sport. Yeah, does that, does that make sense as well? And they're, they're working really nicely there. And then finally, I thought I'd include these guys, the kind of stand-up paddleboarders, because this is a good example of, of how we have trends within the outdoor sector, you know, like any other sport. But I think there are some really interesting trends that are worth, worth thinking about. The outdoor industry is breaking down into ever-increasing specialist niche and nuance. It's just like any other kind of, you know, evolving, emerging kind of market. So it's the classic long tail model. There used to be a few really big providers who would do a few of the really big key activities. And now there's a million and one different small little businesses that are all doing subtly different niche things. A good example of that within panel boarding is this might be a new, a new fad, a new trend. We've seen a huge amount of growth, but is it going to be the next windsurfing? Is it going to be the one that sort of comes in, everybody's kind of bowled over by windsurfing, and then where'd it go? You know, it's kind of it's, it's disappeared and tailed off. So is this here to stay, or is it the, the, the next new thing that's going to be replaced by something else? The other thing within that niche nuance, which is interesting, is to think of mountain biking as being the best example. You know, when, when mountain biking was invented something like 20 years ago, people had a mountain bike, you know, and they went mountain biking. And now what we've got is a whole different tribes of people with, you know, five bikes ahead. You know, they've got, they've got their, their sort of, you know, their cyclocross bike, their enduro bike, their, their hardtail, their full suspension downhill bike. And it's even getting to the point that they would see downhill mountain biking almost as being a different sport to cyclocross. You know, they're no, they're no longer off-road mountain biking as, as perhaps they once were. And we're seeing that kind of breakdown right across the, the sector. So, that's great if you're on the inside and you understand it. What is really fascinating with this project is looking at the outdoor industry from the outside as to what it looks like to the customer. Now, I spent years working at, at Placid Brennan, the National Mountain Centre, where we sold mountaineering. And mountaineering is a great example of one of those duff words. If, if I could see a thought bubble, you know, as a picture above your heads when I use the word mountaineering, 
I would probably see 20 different pictures in front of me now. Some of you would have that image of that residential trip and being out in the rain, you know, kind of being miserable in those massive great big Peter Storm anoraks. <laughs> and, and others of you have probably got an image in your head that's all about, you know, using a, a compass and a map and navigating and learning some skills in the outdoors. And others of you have probably got an image that's, you know, all snow and beards and ice axes and Chris Bonington and Himalayas and, and that kind of thing. And they're all mountaineering. And that, that's a real challenge for us. Because if you're trying to sell an activity that is mountaineering, what you think you're selling to somebody is, could be completely different to, to the image that they've got in their mind of what they want. And perhaps the best example I can give you of that is, is abseiling. So let's, let's pluck that one as an example. Almost every other sport in the outdoors works for this. But cast your mind back to that residential experience. You know, here is somebody on a wonderful residential outdoor adventure with a highly qualified teacher and abseiling is a vehicle for personal development. It just so happens that we've got abseiling in this beautiful place rather than canoeing or raft building or whatever else it could have been to achieve those developmental educational aims. What we've got here is you know, a growth of these sort of purpose-built facilities. We've talked about the zip world phenomenon, we've talked about treetops it's sort of uh, you know, ropes courses. We've seen a huge growth in these commercial um, facilities where they're selling abseiling as a commercial activity here. So turn up, pay your money, you can have a go at, at abseiling. What's really interesting is that if you look at um, those educational authority centres we were talking about before that you visited at, at uh, 13, 14 years, of course it, it's almost impossible to take kids out of school now at 13 or 14. So that's gone from being key stage three to key stage two. So it's now nine and 10 year olds that are going to that residential outdoor centre. And that massive journey in that minibus, you know, is really expensive. So, so if, we could, if we could do this closer to home, then it, it's cheaper, we can do it in a shorter time frame, that, that's better. In fact, that really highly qualified outdoor instructor who's a qualified teacher, they're really expensive as well. If we do it like this, we can just have some site-specific training for an 18-year-old GAP student, and they're nice and cheap and convenient, so that's, that's good as well. Now, this all adds up. If you're a teacher... If you're an educational visits coordinator and you want to buy abseiling for your kids, you might have in your thought bubble this wonderful life-changing developmental experience. And what you get is sliding down a rope. You know, and they're both called abseiling, but this isn't what you were, were hoping to achieve. Yeah. The problem for you is that your headmaster likes this because you can get more kids per hour far more cheaply this way than this way. Yeah? Does, that, does that make sense? And this is a real sort of you know, problem phenomenon for the, for the outdoor sector at the moment. And it's the difference between measuring sort of an um, output and outcome, if you like. Yeah? So the output's very high, very efficient here. The outcome is very significant here and, and that doesn't translate across the two. Happy with that? And of course, you know, we've completely forgotten in that that abseiling is a fundamental mountaineering skill. There are people in the world who will go to Placer Brennan because they want to ski that core, and the only way to get there is to learn the skills of abseiling. So, so there's another reason for, for going abseiling, is that it's, a, you know, it's part of your sort of sporting um, development and, and sport-specific learning. Now that really helps us understand the outdoor sector, because you can see how people are doing the same activity in lots of different ways, and it helps you understand how the providers fall into several key camps. So, so activity providers loosely sort of will find themselves on these sorts of, of branches. And when we went and did the research, we found um, 9,600 different providers. And if you were to drill down into their sort of very core for, for why they exist, you would find that, that some of them would have a kind of a sport or, or recreation slant. They are passionate about the sport, about the environment, and about the activity. So national centres like you know, Placid Brennan would be up here. If you follow this branch to its logical conclusion, then Sport England would sit as an, as an overarching sort of organisation that represented that lot, as would the Sport and Recreation Alliance. Yeah? Does, that, does that make sense as well? Um, and at the very sort of doctrine, if you like, at the very heart, all of their policies, procedures, and ethos, it's all built on a sports coaching kind of culture or an activity-specific culture. I've put in there sport and recreation, and that's really important because let's not forget, you know, this is positively informal activity. The fact that those 18,000 people on Snowden can just park their car and go for a walk in the great outdoors without having to go through a turnstile, without having to register, without having to pay, without leaving a fixture, a facility, or anything, that's really important. You know, we, we meddle with that at our peril because it's one of the things that makes outdoor activities so accessible to so many people. 
However, we've seen a very healthy kind of relationship. They're two sides of the same coin. You know, if you talk to the Sport and Recreation Alliance, they're very good at kind of going, no, it's, it's recreation. You know, this is, this is activity that's recreation, it's not sport. But, you know, Danny Arnold, to take it to a, an extreme level, holds the record for climbing the north face of the Eiger in two and a half hours. Now, he can only go out and do that high level of recreation on the weekend by stealing a lot of know-how from the sports side. So there's an awful lot about sports coaching, sports physiology, nutrition, training, all those things that people are now stealing from the kind of the sports side for their recreation. And, and somewhere like Placid Brennan, we would see recreational paddlers wanting to improve their standards and wanting to kind of buy in for a while into the kind of the sporting know-how and then go back to informally recreating, if you like, in terms of their, their own participation. Now, down here, <coughs> You've got the development and learning crew, and I suppose if we follow this branch down here, this is where we would find our teachers and our leaders and our facilitators and our development trainers and the sort of man management development training, and we would find the Institute of Outdoor Learning down at the end of this. Because at Placid Brennan, the Institute for Outdoor Learning were largely irrelevant to me and vice versa. So that's not a, that's not a hierarchical judgmental thing, it's just the fact that you know a national centre in sport is not necessarily relevant to the Institute of Outdoor Learning and, and vice versa. And so they're, they're a very different group of people doing it for very different reasons, built on an educational doctrine and a de personal development doctrine rather than a sports specific doctrine. Yeah? Uh, if we go down here, we're going down to the kind of the zip worlds, the climbing walls, the, you know, well, maybe not the climbing walls actually, but the sort of the ropes courses and the, the commercial facility sort of development group. And probably down the end of here, we'd probably find the health and safety executive to be quite honest. You know, or some sort of you know, European norm for, for, for climbing wall structures or, you know, or, or whatever, and upsell towers. So, so that's a very different group of people. It, it's all about getting people in to um, pay for an activity, to take part in an activity. Are we interested in them having a lifetime in sport? No, not really. Are we interested in developing them and making them better people? No, not really. We're interested in coming back next time and having another go with their mates and bringing their family. Yeah? So that's, that, that's you know, kind of the difference there. Now there's this group in the middle that's, that's really important and we talked about the importance of finding people to participate with. There are some lovely examples in here. The social connection element is really important to folks. A lot of people would come to Placid Brennan because if you live in the southeast of England and you want to go sea kayaking, one of the hardest things is finding other people to go sea kayaking with and it's not safe to go and do it on your own. Yeah? Um, and what we found is there's probably a great demand for this and not very much supply for this, or the, or the providers don't recognise the importance of this and in, in the role that they provide. Another good example um, within Snowdonia is we've seen traditional climbing clubs, single sport clubs, really struggling for numbers. We've seen adventure clubs where it's like, well, come along, we'll do something different every week, and we're, you know, they're, they're absolutely booming. So the traditional model of clubs being sport specific is, is not necessarily working in the, in the, the kind of the modern age in, in the outdoors. Yeah? Now, just very quickly, and I will be quick on this, you can dig into this in the report, I won't. They might be different, but they all rely on each other. You know, and, and just to summarise the detail of that, it's very simple. These guys might be all about the sport and the activity, but they actually provide the national governing body training and assessment of awards that qualify mountain leaders to deliver this stuff or to deliver this stuff. There is a huge amount that this lot have learned about the soft skills side of facilitation and education and development and, and, and the sort of the customer experience, the quality of customer experience will fall out of the educational side into the commercial facilitation. And you could be the most hardcore elite sports organisation in the world, but you've still got to balance the books. So an awful lot of people will rely on doing some of this for an income stream. Okay? And that's really important because almost all of these providers therefore do a bit of, of everything. Why is that important? Well, when you look at who we found, um, don't worry about this. These, these are just some threats. It's not all positive either. You know, these guys will see the kind of the Disneyfication of, of their activity as a real threat. You know, and these guys will see the, the sportification of recreational activity as a as a real threat. The, the more you do this, the more the eyes of the, the health and safety executive are on you, and, and you know, the more sort of industrial it becomes, and that and that's a real threat. And why is it important? Well, when you try and segment the different types of providers. You can't do it by activity because they all deliver a bit of everything. And you can't do it by sport because they often deliver four or five different sports. So it just doesn't work. And what we found were 9,600 different activity providers in the outdoor sector. 
And we found they loosely come under these 21 different headings. So I'll talk you through some of the, the important ones, but you can, you can look all this bit up in, in the report. It's all in there. Okay. What was really interesting is that, let's start with the big picture, that 9,600. Nobody expected us to find that many. The Adventure Activities Licensing Authority licenses and regulates the outdoor sector. And that was set up in the mid-90s after the Lyme Bay disaster. It was the first time there was any kind of licensing or regulation at all. And it was set up to license the commercial delivery for under-18s of 25 key outdoor activities. Okay. Now, there are 1,438 other licenses, so only 15% of the providers are licensed, and the rest of them are all completely unregulated. So all you have to do is do something in a voluntary way, you don't need a license. Do it to adults, you don't need a license. You could set yourself up tomorrow as you know, um, John, John Smith, mountaineering instructor, and take people ice climbing on the north face of Nevis, and you don't need a qualification or regulation or license or anything to do that to consenting adults. Okay? So the, the outdoor sector is largely unregulated, unregistered. There is no central sort of database or list of these, these providers. The guys at Alice said, you know, you will find about 2,000 activity providers. We only know 1,400 of them. You know, the guys at AdventureMark, AdventureMark exists as a quality assurance badge, and they, they uh, recognise 78 different activities. So, that, so that basically there are some of these um, independent companies and some of these small sort of um, independent activity centres, they've set themselves up and they will deliver anything but one of those 25 activities that comes under our licensing, because then they don't need a licence. If they do all the activities that don't quite sort of come under that umbrella, then they can get away without the cost and without the bureaucracy. So Adventure Mark set, set up, they've got about 1,600 Adventure Marks um, to look at the best practice in 78 different activities. Okay. Um, and the Institute for Outdoor Learning, they did a bit of research on this. They found about 2,000. Everybody reckoned there were about 2,000 activity providers. So we found you know, over four times that many. We found 9,600 activity providers across the sector. What was interesting, of course, coming from a national centre background, because this was a Sport England project, you know, we started up here with national centres and national governing body development programmes. And, um, and then a kind of, you know, we knew the sport-specific clubs. We knew the adventure travel companies, your Jagged Globes, your Karakoram Experience, all those kind of people. And we knew all the kind of specialist activity centres, the surf schools, the climbing schools, the, the indoor climbing walls. They were easy to find. For me, I, I, I live down here, I work with you know, Walking for Health and I work with county sports partnerships and I work with you know, event management organisations like Nova and Limelight who deliver the Great North Run or the Great North Swim. You know, those, those are the people that, that they would relate to. And as somebody who had spent 25 years in the outdoor industry, I didn't even know who these people were. And it was amazing. You know, it, it made us realise that, that you don't have to see this through, through your own lens and your own telescope wherever you are in that sector. And if that's baffling for us on the inside, imagine being a customer or a consumer trying to buy into that and work out what providers you need to deliver your activity. It's really, really very difficult. So what we did was we, um, we, we sort of clustered them down into those 21 sort of broad headings. When you look at that fundamental doctrine, they come down into this sort of a mix. About 34% of them are, are sport specific. About 36% of them are the kind of the development and learning crew. And about 25% of them are the commercial facilities. Um, and only 4% are the, uh, kind of you know, born out of social connection. So instantly you realize that that's a kind of an opportunity there. If that's something that matters an awful lot to the participant, but there, there's not an awful lot of provision or, or value in that in the provision, then there's an opportunity.